won't believe what just happened to me. I was attacked by a swarm of bees. Bees don't swarm at night. But these bees did. In fact, I happened to nab the nasty little bugger who bit me. He's in this cup. That's very strange, squad. According to the encyclopedia, bees always die shortly after stinging their victims. Maybe this one can't read. <laughs> I work as night watchman here at Fred's Wax Museum to put myself through criminology college. It used to be very lonely, until recently when I plugged in my crime computer. Suddenly, oscillating vibrations brought to life three legendary monsters. Dracula. The werewolf. And Frankenstein. Creatures hated and feared for centuries, now determined to make up for their past misbehaving by fighting crime wherever they find it. Together, we're the Monster Squad. Welcome back, citizens, to an all-new episode of the Bat Cave Podcast. It's your old bat chum, John S. Drew, here. And finally, after all this time, I've been promoting it up the wazoo here on the various other episodes of the Bat Cave Podcast. We are sitting down to talk Monster Squad, that 1976-77 television series that was primarily spearheaded by Stanley Ralph Ross. And as I've been doing with all these different shows and movies and such, I've been bringing in new co-hosts to help me talk through these shows here, to give me a different perspective on things. And joining me for this run of the Monster Squad is a man that should be familiar to you if you hear him over at Revolution SF or if you see him every year moderating or co-moderating the American classic sci-fi track over at Dragon Con, Mr. Joe Crow. Hey, Joe. Hey, Mr. John. How are you, sir? I am doing well, sir. Doing very well. And I want to thank you for this. Now, let me ask you something. Why were you eager to do Monster Squad? I was a, you said 76, 77. Right. Is that when the show was out? That's it. I, I watched this thing every morning live when it came out because it was live action superhero stuff. I was all in. <laughs> and, and the fact that it was done, though, with the uh, classic monsters didn't bother you. No, 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 no. And in retrospect, now that I've watched it again as a slightly older person, it's an odd duck. Yes. So <laughs> it definitely is an odd duck show. But you can see as you're watching it the little hints of Batman involved there. And although instead, this time, instead of a duo, we're getting a whole team. Yeah. I did not know the connection between this show and the original Batman show until you pointed it out to me. Oh, really? But now I see it. Now, <laughs> um, in, in watching it watching it again, uh, now it's 100% a Batman 66-inspired show. It has that tone. And, oh, ab about the team question. Yeah, they... Of course, it's a different dynamic than... And I, there I said it, the different dynamic than Batman and Robin. Thank you. <laughs> but yeah, it's a different dynamic than just the mentor-mentee situation of Batman and Robin. It's just three monster dudes who, um, they're, they're just kind of like the Golden Girls. They behave like the Golden Girls. <laughs> okay, now you've given me a new perspective in thinking of this show. Now, I, well, here's the thing, though. I'm not entirely sure because this episode doesn't establish it well, but I've read this in a few other places. These are actually just wax figures that somehow come to life and decide to make up for the evil deeds of the original monsters by fighting crime. I, I confess that I did not understand when I was seven years old and I do not understand now. 
That part I could not wrap my head around. Although my thought is, why they got to be wax figures? Why couldn't they just have been the, the monsters frozen in time mm -hmm. and Fred Grandy revives them? How would that have been more difficult than, <laughs> than the way they did it? I don't know, because... I don't know. You're actually, you're right. Why couldn't they just have been frozen? We didn't need a great deal of details as seven-year-olds back then. <laughs> no. And I guess, and the idea that they're, I mean, what was in, in the 70s was the uh, Groman's Chinese Theater and the Madame Tussauds wax figures, were they such a pop culture thing that people, that would they had to have a show about them? I mean, was that... I don't remember it being such a big deal. No, no, me either. I mean, there is uh, 10 years previously, which I've reviewed, there is an episode of The Green Hornet called Alias the Scarf, in which you're left wondering, is it a wax figure that comes to life of this serial killer? Or is it the actual serial killer come back? Or is it somebody who just admires the serial killer and takes his place? But the whole story takes place in this wax museum where they are unveiling uh, figures of the Green Hornet and Cato. So somehow the wax figures of Frankenstein, the Wolfman, and um, the other one. <laughs> <laughs> Dracula. Dracula. So Somehow they got transported from that wax museum with the Green <laughs> Hornet into the basement of the wax museum with uh, Fred Grandy. Yeah, right. clearly that must have happened. And what's interesting to it too is that Dracula is Dracula. They call him Dracula. But uh, Wolfman is Bruce W. Wolf. He's got a full name. And for that matter, Frankenstein's monster who really he should be called Frankenstein's monster. Frankenstein was the creator. But in this case, the monster is given the name Frank N. Stein. <laughs> Respect for that. That, <laughs> that. that cracked me up as soon as they, they said, this is his name. I, I just, I thought that's, it was, it's sitting right there. Why has no one ever used it before in any other Frankenstein thing? But yeah, there it is. Uh, and I was, I, I that that just that that made me laugh. Yeah, <laughs> of course. Why not call him Frank N. Stein? It's sitting right there in front of your face. Now, Mr. Stein, we'd like to ask you a few questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, fire, I don't like. Uh, <laughs> uh. Oh, and and if they had dialed in on the wax figure situation. Wouldn't fire be even more of an enemy to Frankenstein? True. It could have melted him. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> that's true. That's true. But see, that's the other thing, too, as we'll see later on. For a wax figure come to life, you've got uh, Wolfman there, his hair. And, of course, he's upset because he's getting it all sticky with the honey. <laughs> <laughs> Man, the the wax and the honey, that's not a good mix. No. <laughs> uh, I, at the end of, at the end of the day, when something something like that happens, when they have to go back into their pods, does Fred Grandy like have to hose them down? Does he have, <laughs> have to get the honey off of the Wolfman wax figure? I there's a lot of questions. A lot of questions. A lot of questions. Now, before we get into the episode itself, I want to take a few moments here because I'm further going to push the notion that this is a Batman-inspired series because of the caliber of guests and those who are acting in the show. Uh, first of all, as we mentioned, Fred Grandy, front and center here as Walt, who leads the team with his crime computer, giving them tips and, and basically working from what is the equivalent uh, for that time of Electra Base, we know him from the Love Boat. We know him as a member of the House of Representatives for Iowa. That's about it, <laughs> at least yeah, for me. Yeah, that, that's that's everything. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he was probably on Fantasy Island three or four times. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure he did did a few of these guest shots on some of these, and even some comedy shows too. If I took a moment to actually scan down the page. But I was going from off the top of my head what I remembered here. 
Dracula, played by Henry Pollock II. He was the voice of the Scarecrow on Batman the Animated Series. I did not know that. Mm-hmm. That's great. Yeah. Buck Cartellian, who plays Bruce W. Wolf, was in the Planet of the Apes movie as Julius, and he would later appear as an ape in Conquest of the Planet of the Apes. So... So is, was he like just a, a makeup stunt guy? I, I think so, from the looks of it, yeah. Yeah. And those then, guys are so uh, – I love <laughs> those guys because they are in everything. Yes. And like, like, like the guy that played Swamp Thing, Dick Durock, he, he, he was in like 30 things. And so, yeah, this uh, the and, and you could kind of – I feel like Bruce W. Wolf, he was just super excited to have a speaking role. <laughs> But he, he was great. But anyway, continue. He was. He was. Yeah. And, and my favorite character, just because I loved his, and I, I don't know what else you can call it, his accent, the way he spoke. I just thought it was interesting. Mike Lane plays Frankenstein. And here we go. Here's our Batman 66 connection. He played Daddy Long Legs on the Black Widow episode. I don't know how you do it, Blackie. I tried Robin Banks when I was younger, but I always got nailed before I was out the door. Incentive, Daddy Long Legs. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. That's great. Yep. <laughs> uh, now, the episode, the premiere episode, which premiered September 11th, 1976, was Queen Bee, written by Richard Bluell who folks here will recognize as a producer on the Green Hornet back in 1966. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's so so Stanley Ralph Ross just brought in his pals. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. He also brought in a director he was familiar with, James Sheldon, who would go on to direct four more episodes of Monster Squad, as well as Julie Newmar's first appearance as Catwoman in Batman 66. That is solid gold. It's all coming together. You can see it. The writing, the producers, the directors, some of the actors. And then we come to our guest cast here. Not so much Batman related, but names you might recognize. Alice Ghostly as Queen Bee, who I think most people remember from Bewitched as basically the replacement for Aunt Clara. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I love Alice Ghostly, and seeing her in this I was joyful because she's been in so many things yes. from our childhoods, my, mine and yours, and, and I'm sure you know, well, tons of other, well, every all all the all the Bat Cave podcast listeners. But this lady is so good. It, it's like it's um, she has a a, a persona. That no matter what she's playing, she's still Alice Ghostly. <laughs> yes, and she has that Alice Ghostly thing that, uh, or she she's always playing the same type of person. Right, and and it's great. It's <laughs> she's just on it. She's like an old timey comedian. You know, mm-hmm. she's just always like punchline, side eye, double takes, boom, 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 just professional. I love it. And yet. She also does have her serious role side. She played Aunt Stephanie in the Gregory Peck uh, version of To Kill a Mockingbird. Oh, oh my. Yeah. I, I did not make that. I, <laughs> my, wow. Yeah. Okay. So she, she's got her serious moments there, too. And yet also, just to bring it in with Batman, she was a regular on the NBC show Captain Nice which was basically their answer to Batman. Ah, I love it. As the American sci-fi classics co-director, I feel like I have a there there's a a there's a a, a check mark missing that I have not seen. Ah. Nice. And I I really feel like I've let my people down by not <laughs> Having seen that, so I got I to gotta, I gotta go into that. I got to get that done. I think you can find some episodes. There's not a complete run, but I think you can find some of them on YouTube. YouTube is the go-to for anything these days. Oh, sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 
our Queen Bee has her henchmen, just like in the Batman days. These two are Spelling Bee and Bumblebee. Spelling Bee <laughs> is played by Hamilton Camp, who was a Ferengi in a couple of episodes of DS9, uh, as well as an episode of Voyager. But you may know him better as the voice of Gizmo Duck on Darkwing Duck and DuckTales. <laughs> I love him so much. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And Spelling Bee, of course, is near and dear to my heart as a as a professional editor. I thought, <laughs> this this is my guy. I can see why someone obsessed with spelling would turn bad. Yes. I get it. <laughs> And Bumblebee is played by Al Mancini from Britain. Uh, he appeared in the movie The Dirty Dozen as Tassos Bravos. And you may know him as the general, or I'm sorry, no, the announcer in the episode, The General, in The Prisoner, for you Prisoner fans. There's so much. I mean, yeah. they these shows, Monster Squad was just a Saturday morning thing that I bet went under the radar for most things and yet these are showbiz veterans yep that are just knocking it out of the park yep well it's interesting you say under the radar and yet for a show that was only on for one year it had a fair amount of merchandising including a board game and if i'm not mistaken wasn't the 80s version of monster squad the movie wasn't that still the basic thrust of the TV show, as in The Monsters Come to Life. You know who to call when you have ghosts. But who do you call when you have monsters? We're the Monster Squad. What's a squad? It's like Miami Vice, I think. They're young and inexperienced. Naughty virgin! They're a bit disorganized. Monsters are not real. We don't know that, sir. 2,000-year-old dead guys do not get up and walk away by themselves. But when strange things start happening in town... There's a monster in my closet. Ooh! Look at that big, scary monster! What's happening? Do I see a werewolf? Silver bullet? They're the only ones ready to do battle. Something's out there that's killing people. And if it's monsters, nobody's going to do a thing about it but us. Soon the creatures of the night show will move around. Real monsters? Us? Midnight in the world, remember? Maybe we can be like Mask Squad instead, you know? Two mask bombs. We got 235. Big back up. Hurry up! Yeah. I'll meet your squad. The book is right. Don't you see it's all true? By midnight, you guys. they won't seem so young anymore. Monster Squad. Wolfman Squad. Oh yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. that's the one thing I have not seen is the '80s Monster Squad movie. Now it's it's very '80s, but I mean that as a compliment. <laughs> it's it's super '80s, and and it. In fact, when you're trying to find the Monster Squad TV show, the only thing that comes up on the internet inter interwebs is the movie. Yes. But the, the movie's good, too. The movie is very much in the vein of Goonies and um, well, and now Stranger Things. It's it's the same kind of deal. It's it's, it's very good. I'm going to have to take a look at it. My wife and I do a like a summer movie thing where every other week we pick a movie – you know, I'll pick one one week, the next week she picks another. And it's movies either we feel we haven't seen together or movies that I've never shown her or she's shown me. But maybe that's one I can slide into the, our summer mu movie viewing. Yeah, oddly enough, I thought I had seen it. It's one of those that f from years ago that you assume you've seen it mm -hmm. because you know everything about it, you know, and maybe, you, but it turns out. I had not seen it all the way through until recently, <laughs> but I'd seen the clips of it here and there, and I knew uh, the all the details of it. But 
maybe it just kind of seeped into my mind from <laughs> it being on on background on TBS when right. I was surfing or when I was just doing. I almost said doing housework, but when I was a teenager, that did not happen. So. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure it didn't with me. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, let's get into the episode here. We're going to break it down, you know, scene by scene and discuss the things that we liked, the things that we didn't like, and see where we can pull some of the Batman things as we go along here. I'll point out things I recognize as, wow, Stanley Ralph Ross our producer, who was a writer for Batman 66, he may have repeated some of his jokes, or as we'll see in later episodes, he actually uses jokes that the producers of Batman rejected. Oh, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so he gets to work in those old gags. Now, the show opens with Frank having trouble getting his radio to work because all it does is buzz. Well, all I can get on this radio is a lot of buzzing on every station. Well, ask Bruce. He was listening to it earlier. Oh, I don't want to wake him. He was out late playing at the moon. It was full last night. I'm just going to let him enjoy it. It sounds like this station's being attacked by a swarm of bees. All right, right there off the bat, buzzing. We know this is Queen Bee. Now, Walter looks at the radio, and, you know, being the, the technological genius he is, he created the co crime computer and all, he can't figure it out as Bruce then wakes up and Drax, or Drac, I'm going to be doing this, it's not Drax, it's Drac. Drac literally stumbles in from... Uh, outside, and I've got to wonder from the looks of it, that wasn't supposed to happen because Drac looks just as surprised that he didn't fall flat on his face. And what was he? Where was he? Was he slaking his fill of the blood of innocent? <laughs> no, no, no. Did did he say where he? I know he he's got the whole story. He was attacked by a swarm of bees at night, which is also unusual because bees don't come out at night. They're out during the day. But did he say what he was doing? I forget. I don't recall. I don't recall, I'm assuming, but I'm assuming he must have lied to cover up his, his <laughs> arcane deeds because he is a vampire. <laughs> Well, that, that's something we never get into in the show either. At least Buffy and uh, uh, Angel deal with that, that he keeps blood uh, in the fridge. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, now, Drac has caught the bee that stung him because one did. And I thought this was interesting. It didn't die because usually the bees die as soon as they sting, don't they? Yeah. 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 <laughs> to my very basic sci-fi not, uh, it's not sci-fi bees are real yes they're not science <laughs> <laughs> to my very basic knowledge bees do die when they stay right <laughs> they, they'll become science fiction at the rate things are going here with them disappearing exactly yeah walter takes the bee puts it in the crime computer determines it's a south american killer bee because he recognizes the accent <laughs> so good yeah yeah, and the bee is buzzing in what sounds a lot like Morse code, and basically what it's saying is, bees of the world attack, you have nothing to lose but your stingers. <laughs> mm. uh, yeah. yeah. Now, Walter cuts into the secret government channel, which reports to various secret agencies. This is not a drill. This is a secret report from your secret commentator on your secret government channel and is being brought to you in total secrecy. All secret branches of the government have been secretly alerted to a strange phenomenon that has been sweeping the city since early evening. There has been an unexplained rash of bee stings, and although no fatalities have been reported, informed sources say the matter could become quite serious if the attacks increase in number and intensity. A sneak attack, men! This is a day that will live in infamy. Now, wait a minute. It's my guess that our friend in here and his buddies, our only scout bees, sent ahead of the rest of the armada. Boy scout bees or girl scout bees? Does it really matter? It does to them, yes. No. Drac is right. 
Only one thought should concern us now. Who is behind this nefarious scheme and where can they be located? And we cut to the Queen Bee. Now, this is also interesting because here's a question. Is this a person just dressed in a bee outfit who manages to control bees? Or is this some sort of mutant? We established that wax figures can come to life. <laughs> yes. I, <laughs> I, 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 I want to think, much like all the Batman-style villains uh, from Batman 66, that she was not a mutant, but <laughs> okay. just some, some lady who, who, who just... She had she had a B thing and and made a criminal career out of it. There you go. <laughs> and just like a uh, Batman villain, a lot of puns dealing with bees. Please, beloved Majesty, it was just a small mistake. Give me one more chance. I beseech. Do not bewail your fate. I have already given you a hundred chances, Sam Bumblebee, but you always bumble. A bumble here, a bumble there, here a bumble, there a bumble, everywhere a bumble, bumble. But please, give me one more chance. I only want to serve you. <sighs> Very well, Bumble. On your behalf, I will give you one more chance, but that is it. Believe me. Uh, yeah. Gold. Gold. <laughs> Oh, good. In fact, the, the puns are going back and forth as poor Bumblebee pleads for his life, asking for one more chance. Apparently, he's been, you know, doing things wrong here. She turns around, issues a warning to the world with the aid of Spelling Bee. She will have her Bee Armada attack if the world does not surrender. And that's pretty high stakes for... For a kid's show. <laughs> I mean, I mean, this we're going all in on episode one. This is this is the the world is at stake, and it's just three monster dudes who sleep in glass cases. Yeah, that's not true. Wait, wait, I'm trying to remember. Yeah, they're like pods or something, right? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Oh. And, and the funny thing is, I'm thinking about this, going, yeah, these are greater odds than the Super Friends even deal with. That's really true. In <laughs> fact, um, like really on Batman 66, the biggest stakes were just Gotham. Right. Uh, and then they went to London once, but uh, Londinium, I apologize. Londinium. <laughs> but, but stakes were never higher than that. But this is episode one, Monster Squad. The world yep. is going to get overwhelmed by bees. And I got to say, as a seven-year-old, and really as a forty-nine-year-old, that's terrifying. <laughs> okay, now we move through Act One pretty quickly here, but I got to throw this question out to you as we come to the end of Act One. You guys, we have got to stop her. We don't even know where she has her hide. Wait a minute, I've got an idea. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't send a kid up in a crate like that on a night like this. He really moves his tail for us. But I don't get the reference Bruce makes when he says, I wouldn't send a kid in a crate like that on a night like this. <laughs> what? What does that mean? No, I know. <laughs> Are you suggesting you put kids in crates normally? Why, why does a werewolf put a kid in a crate? Yes. <laughs> he, uh, shouldn't he just eat him? <laughs> what or is he saving them for later? Do they mail children to each other? <laughs> Maybe this was part of their evil deeds of the past. <laughs> it was so 
<laughs> he was so mortified that he'd sent kids off in crates. Now he's trying to make up for it. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, Act 2 opens up, and we find out the UN is meeting and deciding what to do, but meanwhile, the Scout B returns to the Hive and tries to warn the others about the Monster Squad. That's when Drac appears before them and tries to present himself as someone who could help the Queen Bee with her plan, rather than going right off, which oftentimes we see in these shows, you know, you will never get away with this. No, he tries to work beneath them and, and try and get in and on their plan more. Now, one thing, are you a fan of Babylon 5? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who does Drac sound like? Allow me to introduce myself. I am Count Dracula, president of the Central Bat Society. What brings you here? I like your style. I would like to lock wings with you, get a piece of the honeycomb, so to speak. <laughs> ah, Mr. Morgan. I see they found you. Good, good. You're looking well. All healed now, I take it? I'm fine. What the hell is going on, Malari? A number of Vorlon ships are on their way here, accompanied by one of their planet killers. They will arrive in a matter of hours. They have been wiping out any colony, world, or outpost where your associates have influence. Oh, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I did not think of that until just now. I know. He's, he sounds just like Londo. <laughs> exactly. He, Again, there's like a, there's so much going on with this show. Yes. Instead of just saying, okay, th like like you said, instead of just saying, well, these are three heroes. Now let's. But he's playing on his reputation as the Lord of the Vampires. <laughs> yes. And saying, hey guys, I'm evil and I want to help you. <laughs> Why wouldn't they say, of course it's Dracula. This is a great deal. We're we're getting the outside help. Oh yeah, and of course th there is suspicion. Of course. Yeah. But <laughs> but yeah, but he has a he has a he doesn't even have to come up with an alibi. He they could just say, "Look, I'm Dracula." And they yeah. they should be like, "Oh, okay." Yep. He's uh, the legendary vampire lord. Come on. <laughs> you would think that that would be, you know, all you need your your uh what is that? When what was that expression when they say your reputation precedes you? It's like my re I do not have to show you my resume. <laughs> now, meanwhile, back at the Wax Museum, Walter gets more news of the UN meeting. While the UN still remains in emergency session, they've gotten as far as the T's in their roll call. Reports are flooding in from the various capitals of the world. The Russians have already agreed to turn over their entire nation rather than risk attack from the V Armada. But the government of Liechtenstein has vowed to fight to the death. Hooray for a little Lichtenstein! In fact, they plan to issue a new stamp in commemoration of the event. They always do that. Remind me to send away for a sheet of those. You guys don't seem to realize we could all be stung to smithereens by morning. Even if you had one of those stamps, you wouldn't have the saliva to lick it. Man, this is serious. I wonder why we haven't heard from Drac. Maybe we should try and get in touch with him. Good thought, Bruce. We'll use the beeper. Now, that's the kind of humor that's for the parents. That's the Batman influence there that someone adult-like would chuckle. The kids would look and go, huh? What's Lichtenstein? What's Lichtenstein, right? <laughs> is, is Lichtenstein related to Frank Einstein? <laughs> I don't know. I just, I just thought, okay, I mean... It's not the funniest bit, but it's cute. And I, you can see that he was trying to work in different layers, just like they did on the Batman show, to appeal to the adults and the kids alike. Uh, exactly. There's a lot of workmanship. <laughs> Surprisingly so. Right. Uh, in, 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 in this show. Yep. Yeah. We cut back to Drac, who's having tea with the Queen Bee. He suggests to her that he could be her king, but he is betrayed by Walter, who tries to call him via the communicator. So the Queen orders him thrown in a vat of honey where he cannot fly away. Now, I don't know about you, you know, 
mind you, we're looking at these and they didn't do any upgrades, but that didn't look like honey to me. It just looked like some sort of viscous fluid that covers him. <laughs> and, uh, and he's already, uh, uh, again, allegedly, he's already wax. Why? <laughs> yeah, but she doesn't know that, does she? She doesn't know that. Yeah. She doesn't know that. Maybe, okay, maybe, and this is canon in my head, Maybe they're not wax figures. Maybe they are the real dudes, and everyone thought they were wax figures mm. because they're frozen in a in a museum. And maybe um, Walt goes, "Well, clearly these must be wax figures. I work in a museum." And then, surprisingly, they came to life. I don't know. I'm putting too much thought into it. <laughs> wait, a minute, wait a minute. I'm going to go one better for you then, because just based on what you're saying now, maybe they're like the gargoyles. They're wax at certain times, and then at night they come out of their wax casing and come to life. Perfect. <laughs> See, we've figured it out. There you go. We've broken the code. <laughs> that has to be what it is. Because, That's it. Yeah, uh, we got it. We nailed it. <laughs> So here you go, folks. From now on, that's the way you got to think of them as as gargoyles. <laughs> exactly like gargoyles. Exactly. Uh, with, with Drac being with Goliath. The New York accents. Yes. Of the gargoyles. <laughs> yes. Uh, we cut back to the wax museum where Walter is able to determine where Drac is and sends the rest of the squad to find him since. Drac is not responding to calls on the communicator. Meanwhile, back at the hive, the queen bee puts Drac now well covered in honey in this glass case with a honey bear chasing him about. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't put anybody in a bear suit and expect <laughs> me to not laugh. Yeah. <laughs> solid gold. It is. Now, do you... Did you notice, though, with the exception of the stock footage of the Monster Squad van leaving the Wax Museum, everything has been interior set so far? I did not notice that. But, yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's very, again, that's very Batman 66. Right, true, true. It was always a thrill when we used to see the exteriors, though. So I'm hoping that there'll be some of that as we go along. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I um, in every episode, I want a weird villain hideout for sure. Mm. But then I also want to. I guess it's it's nighttime. Maybe there's nothing going on in the town. Well, that's uh, when, that's true. Yeah, yeah, and it could, and, and and it would mean that you would have to do because night shots, even still in the seventies, were a rough deal to do. Uh, what they call day for night, which are terrible. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the the Green Hornet is a good example of that because most of that takes place at nighttime and they do day for night shots and the filtering is just, it's off. It makes it worse, I think, in many ways. They might have been better off just doing night shooting, but whatever. As, as soon as you said that, I remembered a scene from the Green Hornet where they did exactly that. And mm -hmm. it was in a wide open field. Shoot, I, I don't remember any details. I just that uh, when when you said that, my first thought was a Green Hornet episode where it was it was shot from far away, and you just see the Black Beauty pulling up and Cato getting out, and you know wasting a squad of people, and then the Green Hornet clambering out of the car behind him <laughs> and um, taking out a couple of dudes. But it was grainy and hazy, yep. and and it clearly. It looked like it was shot at like 5.30 a.m. Right. Somewhere, but it was supposed to be at, at night. Yeah, exactly. And it's just, it was hard to see. Uh, yeah. it, it proved interesting when we were watching the episodes and then I would try to do screen grabs to promote. And I'm like, I really want to show some of the Hornet and Cato in action, but most of those are exteriors at night, not interiors. <laughs> <laughs> They can control the everything in interiors, so yeah. that they should. Sometimes you got to stick with what you what you got. Yeah, exactly. Hey, my friend, let's not rush into anything. Uh, haven't I seen you someplace before? Uh, on a poster, uh, except you were wearing a funny little hat. Uh, Hang in there, Bobby. Atta boy. Shouldn't you be out dousing campfires somewhere? Keep your left arm. Stick in with that jab. 
like a butterfly sting like me. It can't last longer than three rounds. The bat is getting befuddled. Three to one on the bear. Now, act three opens, and we see the queen bee taunting Drac with a, a Muhammad Ali misquote there about floating like a butterfly and stinging like a bee. <laughs> And Muhammad Ali was around yes. at the time. And oh, yeah. at what one of the heights of it. In fact, I think around a year or two of this show, there was a Muhammad Ali cartoon show. That, that was a solid pop culture reference, right? Right. There. Oh, yeah. The bees get word that the world will give in to them, save for Lichtenstein. <laughs> <laughs> love it. I love it. And it's not enough for the queen bee, though, because she said she wants total control, so she will attack. Man, Alice Ghostly is a super villain. Yes. This. Yep. I believe it. Yep. She's tired of messing around with Samantha, and she she's gone all villain. Yeah, yep. <laughs> now we get this controlled chaos. I'm going to call it because who could that be at this hour? Yes. How do you do? We're from the A1 Exterminating Company, and we got an emergency call from this address. Don't be ridiculous. You can't come in here. That's what you think. <laughs> Don't let anyone move. This is a break. Not a break, dummy. A bus. A bus. Frank and Bruce enter the Queen Bee's place with the smokers that they use to sort of knock back the bees from coming at them. Oh, it feels so good. Just like back at the laboratory with Dr. Frankenstein. Stop enjoying yourself, Frank. Get mad. Yeah, you know. Oh. Oh. The queen bee uses her stinger. It's this electric device she's got on Frank, but he likes it. (laughs) <laughs> oh no, laugh some more now because then the bear gets loose from the casing. <laughs> <laughs> this is my favorite. That was my favorite scene. Oh, uh, and then he starts fighting with Frank a moment before being distracted by the smell of the honey from Drac, so he starts following Drac around. <laughs> Berinsky, have some honey. Come there. Come this way, you little Tasmanian devil dancer. Bruce jumps up, takes out the, the two bees, you know, spelling and, and honey there, while Frank scares the queen bee into falling into the vat, and she screams out she can't swim. Ah! We have to save her, even though she doesn't deserve it. You're right, Frank. But first, I have an idea. Bruce, get ready to go in after her. Me? I'll get my fur all sticky. I've already been in that once tonight, and I've been chased for that beast by hours, and I can't bear it. Not a minute. Hey! Hey! Somebody save me! We are hurrying as fast as we can, dear lady, but these things take time. Oh. Uh, perhaps you could speed things up a bit by canceling the attack on the city by your bee armada. Oh, why, that's blackmail. Exactly. <laughs> All right, 
fight. You win. This is Yellow Leader to BMR, Commander. Come in. Huh? Order them to the North Pole. But they'll freeze their stingers off there. Precisely. Oh. Ah, cancel all battle plans. Proceed to the North Pole. What did he say? Uh, I'm not exactly sure, but I think it was adios. <laughs> Um, and I, I thought this was interesting because that vat wasn't that big, I thought. But Bruce had to go in after her to save her, but would only do it once she calls off the attack. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do, but do you think um, maybe – so in, her villainous plan got to such a point that she held the entire world hostage. Maybe – Take swimming lessons. <laughs> you planned everything else to such a detail, but this one thing in your own hideout. Yes. <laughs> if uh, well, look, look, we've got all these plans down to a microscopic detail, but if somebody happens to throw me into that that stuff, uh, it's over. It's over. But don't we see that quite often in a lot of these shows? The, oh, sure. the villain being hosted by their own petard, as the expression yeah. goes? <laughs> or, in this case, their own betard. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I'm going to have now to have... I'm doing it. Yeah, now that's it. me doing it. <laughs> oh, but it's so easy when you think about it. <laughs> You know what my favorite bit in this whole episode, though, is at the very end, after they've gotten her to agree to stop the attack and everything, is the bear sitting off to the side with his legs crossed, eating honey. <laughs> the bear. Why can't the bear be in every episode? I know. <laughs> the bear's my favorite. The bear is my favorite, too. Yep. And, and as I mentioned at the beginning of the show here, Bruce has difficulty getting the honey out of his hair. So Frank offers him his flea shampoo as a way to do it. I don't know how it's going to work, but whatever. Uh, so good. <laughs> uh, I, I, I tell you, I did laugh at certain things in this episode. There were moments that I was like, that's pretty cool. I I love the uh, Monster Squad van. That is so 70s. Yes. And again, that's a compliment. <laughs> that, uh, vans were the big deal. Everybody wanted a van mm -hmm. uh, when, when I was when I was that age. I our family did not have one. And I was jealous <laughs> of people that did because you can hold everything in it. Yes. And there were so many um, action figures of the time that had toy vans that came yeah. with, I mean, outside of, you know, the Barbie fashion van, which in retrospect is kind of weird. But <laughs> the um, I seem to recall that Big Jim, that was my favorite. Big Jim, I think, had a van and, and various other because because you could you could stuff everything in there. Yeah. And of course, the 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 legendary Scooby Doo van. That, oh, that, yeah. That's that's the icon right there but for everybody else to have a van too i mean that's 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 the dream you know it's funny because you got me thinking because like back in the 70s you were either cool or you were looked at as someone who just had like your your love pad with your van because you'd have it all decked out ready for the ladies and all that and nowadays we look at vans sadly and we're like keep the kids away from it <laughs> exactly yeah now do not go near yeah. such a thing. Even, and uh, my, my daughter is 16, and um, amongst her group, they make jokes about white panel vans. Oh, jeez. I mean, it's in the culture. It's in their, 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 in, in their culture. They yeah. get, don't go near a white panel van. Yeah. But they, they joke about it. They're like, up, oh, up, oh, there's another one. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, like, up, oh, up, oh, he's. Watch out, Quinns! Yeah, they're, they're gonna the the white panel vans right here. It's gonna get you. You know, Jeez. it's it's just a running gag with them. Now. Right. <sighs> but back in the day, you were like, "Hey, man, vans are great." Yep. Yeah. Put all your stuff in it. They've got shag carpeting. <laughs> yes. 
the shag carpeting in the van. In the van. Now, I forget if eventually, and again, this comes back to me talking about exterior shots and everything. Will we see the interior of the van other than the cab area where they're driving? I hope so. I I wish. Yeah, I hope so. I, and now, of course, now I got to wonder because I said merchandising. Was there a Monster Squad van toy? Man, that they missed out. Yeah. I, I would have bought that. Or I guess as a seven-year-old, I would have put that on a list of things that my parents would have and grandparents would have inevitably not bought. <laughs> oh, I'm looking here. Oh, oh, hang on. Hang on. I'm finding, is it real though? I'm finding a picture. Oh, oh, Okay. Because I, I, I'm heading over. Are you familiar with uh, Plaid Stallions? Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. I love that. Yeah. The Plaid Stallions website has the Monster Squad merchandise listed here, including. Oh, I see. It was never made. They were proposed toys and there was a van. Well, they missed out. Yeah. They missed they, they missed the boat on that one. They... I think Monster Squad could have been the next Star Wars. There, there was. Merchandising if they, they got that van done. <laughs> they've got the van. They've got the action figures, which were never done either. Oh, man. Come on. Yeah. Wow. Easy. I, mean, I would have loved to have had. Fr- I know. I think Mego had eight inch Universal Monsters. Right. Uh, I feel like they did mm-hmm. uh, at the time, but I would have loved. I, I would have been all over. Monster Squad stuff. Right. In fact, I kind of, I'd be all over it today, <laughs> especially now. Especially now that I've seen this. Now, what I want is Monster Squad figures and a bear. <laughs> and who wouldn't want? Who wouldn't want an Alice Ghostly figure? Come on, people. <laughs> the, the Funko, not, not uh, uh, the Funko. The people that make the Super Seven action figures, the uh, reaction. Star Wars size figures. I know they've done Universal Monster. They got to get on Monster Squad. They got to do it. Now, some of the other things, there were costumes the, the, the with the plastic masks and such for Wolfman. I'm seeing pictures here, Wolfman and Dracula. I've not seen one for Frankenstein. There were trading cards. There was the board game that I mentioned from Milton Bradley. This company... Although it doesn't say Monster Squad, it clearly was influenced by it. They produced these bendy figures of the Monster Squad. You can see that it looks just like them, but it says bendable chained monsters. Come on. Uh, They're your own personal monster pals you wear around your neck. I want, now I want them <laughs> There was a Frankenstein Monster Squad punching bag. Sure, yeah. And a Monster Squad coloring book. Where was all this stuff? I, I know. No, I would have been the prime, and, and you too. I, I would have. <laughs> we would have been the prime candidates for all this stuff being merchandised to us. Yep. And I've, I'm first hearing about it right now. Yeah. Yeah. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I'll put the link to the Plaid Stallions article so you can all see it there in the show notes when I release this episode. But yeah, <laughs> that 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 uh, van looks really sweet the way they've got it designed here. Man, yeah, I'm so jealous. Yeah. All right, let me ask you now here because um, I was talking about this with you before the show, and we're going to do a rating of one to fives, but. Each of us are going to come at it with our own one to five whatevers on how to describe this episode. So I ask you, on a scale of one to five, what one to five do you give Queen B? <laughs> we were talking before we went, we went on the air, and I came up with my own rating system. So I'm going to stick with it, although I want to change it now. But okay. I, want, I want to hear yours first. Okay. Yours second. But here, <laughs> coming into the episode. I was gonna, planning on rating the episodes uh, from one to five gophers <laughs> in tribute to Mr. Fred Grandy. Okay. I can, so, you know something? Oh, go, go ahead. 
I kind of like that. I didn't realize at first. I just it just occurred to me because when you said gophers, I was like, "What's that got to do with it?" And then I and now it just clicked. You know something? <laughs> All right, I'll tell you what. Tell me what you wanted to change it to. But really, I like that gophers because I was going to do a rolling thing each episode with different things based on the episode. I was going to do one to five stings this episode, but I like the idea of one to five gophers. And plus, when you post it on the web, you can do little gopher icons. Yes. The more gophers, the better. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and, but, you, you know, my, my, uh, my, my second choice uh, that I came up with during the episode was I wanted to do one to five honey bears. <laughs> you and me were on the same wavelength. That was the exact same thing. We were going to have to change it every time. But right. sadly, there's no honey bear in any of the other episodes. No. Which is ridiculous. <laughs> but and a missed opportunity, but so uh, so great. I I'm 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 down with one to five gophers. Sounds good. All right. So then I'm going to ask you first. How do you rate Queen Bee on a scale of one to five gophers? This one's five gophers all the way. Okay. This is all the gophers you can give it because <laughs> this would have been our first exposure to these characters. This right. would have been the debut. This would have been. First thing Saturday morning, brand new series, and this has everything. <laughs> the, <laughs> so yeah, it has Alice Ghostly, which who is someone we would have known uh, at the time, right? I, I got to say because I, I we we all watched sitcoms. It would have been hey look there's that lady, so we and, and then she and she was great, so she she was an excellent villain and it was very much in the style of the Batman 66 show with the heroes who are goofballs and then the villain. Yeah. Oh yeah. F five gophers all the way. Five gophers. I've got to agree with you. I was a little harsher on it before we started, but in talking about it and then also bringing out more of the Batman 66 connections and stuff, I've got to elevate it as the first episode. I'm going to go with five gophers as well. This one's going to, and granted, yes, it's the first, and, and a lot of times, first episodes are not the best ones. They're no. just getting their feet under them. And um, so it'll be interesting to see as we progress, is this the best, <laughs> is this the best episode? <laughs> it, 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 maybe it is. I mean, it's going to be tough to top. Well, so the rest of the, rest of the series has got to keep up, keep up the good work. I don't know. Well, I, as I said, originally I was going to go a little lower and I was going to then let people know, don't let this discourage you if that were the case, if you felt that I was, you know, not happy about this or something. But I really enjoyed talking about it with you. But to let you know what Queen Bee has going uh, up against it in terms of future episodes, we talked about people and names we recognize. Sid Haig, Billy Curtis... Joe E. Tata, Vito Scotti, Avery Schreiber, Julie Newmar, Jonathan Harris, Marty Allen, and the man himself, Stanley Ralph Ross, will appear in front of the cameras and actually have a speaking role. Whereas when he did it on Batman, they gave him a part and they gave him no lines. <laughs> That's great. Uh, and, and by the way, speaking of Stanley Ralph Ross and the Super Friends, are you aware of his vocal contributions there? I am not. Ah, okay. Well, then, for the sake of everybody here, too, just to really quickly review, in the 70s, Stanley Ralph Ross was the voice of Lex Luthor. The meeting will come to order. The Legion of Doom is now in session. It is the purpose of the Legion to align our infamous forces against the powers of good and defeat them, leaving us the rulers of the world. To do this, we have gathered together the 13 most ruthless villains on Earth, a frigid Captain Cold, the sinister mind of Sinestro, the awesome Bizarro, and Solomon Grundy, the cunning Cheetah, and the super-intelligent computer android Brainiac, Black Manta, and Grodd the Gorilla. 
The Toy Man and the humorous but sinister Riddler. The feminine yet ferocious Giganta and the hideous Scarecrow. <laughs> Not to mention the evil genius and brilliant leadership of myself, Lex Luthor. No way! Yep. Yep. Excellent. He was the voice of, of Lex, and he was also the voice of Gorilla Grodd. Well, Solovar, it's too bad my gallium sulfide vapors have overcome you. You won't be able to watch as I take control of Gorilla City. Wrong, Grodd. I'll be able to watch as my Gorilla Gods capture you. You'll never stop me, Solovar. I'll come back. I'll have my revenge on Gorilla City. <laughs> I love Gorilla Grodd's voice in the Super Friends. My God. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. And and it's sad because when you think about Batman 66, they gave him this voiceless character who just, he's not in the background. He's a character. Uh, Quill Punch, Quill, Quill Punch, something or so, he was he was a forger he was a famous forger and they bring him in at the very end because penguin thinks he's going to have the cell next to him but bruce is having him brought out of jail early to teach penmanship to under uh developed kids or something like that <laughs> and as penguin is like going quill Pedge, come back quill Pedge, come back he just shrugs and is led out of the room by bruce and dick <laughs> Oh, it's 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 hysterical. That's like okay, we gave you a part because he kept begging them from the beginning. Let me, let me. I can act. I've done, and he'd done some acting before. And obviously, he goes on in Super Friends to do voice acting, and he's going to appear. And that's I'm really looking forward to that. He's going to appear in front of the cameras uh, in a future episode. The the list of names that you gave is just a hall of fame yep. of. Uh, Jonathan Harris, I cannot wait because that man is going to just chew up this whole show. You oh, sure. <laughs> I, I, I cannot wait for, for that episode. Yeah. Oh, so it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. Now, speaking of uh, episodes, future episodes, the next episode, when we get together, we're going to be talking about the episode featuring Mr. Mephisto and his plans to replace the mayor with a doll who spouts out radical opinions. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, really, episode two, and you're naming him after the devil. Yes. <laughs> uh, because uh, uh, the my, my first encounter with uh, uh, Mephisto is one of the many devils in Marvel Comics. Yes. And when they said Mr. Mephisto, I thought, oh, geez, this guy's going to be super evil. And it turns out, no, he's he's got it's 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 all political. Yeah, and I'm okay with that. That that that's fun. I can't wait. <laughs> it's going to be a lot of fun. But before we wrap up the show here, Joe, I just want to give you a couple of moments here. How can people get a hold of you if they want to talk to you about this episode or anything else related to classic sci-fi, American science fiction? We have a very busy Facebook group where we talk about this stuff all year round on the Dragon Con American Sci-Fi Classics track, where you, sir, have been a guest yes. in the past. we got to get you back down there um, at some point. But um, every year in Atlanta on Labor Day, coming up in just a month or so, for we, we, we camp out and just do super geeky stuff for four days. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, five days. <laughs> it's, it, it expands. Dragon Con keeps getting bigger and bigger. Facebook.com slash groups slash American Sci-Fi Classics with an S. It's a very busy group, and we, we don't just do stuff when the convention is impending. We 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 were talking and posting neat stuff and doing and giving away prizes and and anyway, all year round. And also on well, I'm, I, I'm on Instagram at Yo Joe Crow with an E at the end. And um, also the Classics Track has an Instagram page and a Twitter a Twitter feed at Classic Track. No wait, um, on Instagram we're Sci-Fi Classic Track. 
Now, as far as Dragon Con, when is that taking place? So if people want to get involved with that and and check it out. That is Labor Day weekend. DragonCon.org has all the details. It's in Atlanta, Georgia. It starts, what is the actual date of Labor Day this week, this year? I do not know. <laughs> I, I'm a great promoter of Dragon Con. I don't know when it is. <laughs> I know it's Labor Day. Well, the, the Labor Day is Monday. Labor Day is the last day. So if you find out on Labor Day that Dragon Con is happening, you're, it's almost over by that point. Right. <laughs> but it, it's, the Thursday, it's, the, it's the preceding four days before Labor Day, and it's also Labor Day. Very nice. And it is a great time. I've been there a couple of times now. Uh, and you're right. I need to get back there. It won't be this year, unfortunately, just with things going on here. But, uh, you know, maybe we can work something out for next year. We had a magnum opus when you were there. You hosted panels with Lee Majors yep. and Lindsay Wagner. We yeah. got both of them. And I was that was that was a big time. They it were was, so nice. They were. They were, and th- this year, um, this year, our, our our big celebrities that we have are Mark Singer and Jane Badler. Yeah, so we've got them together for the. And I, I've um, Mark, Mark Singer has been to Dragon Con in the past, but that was before my time as a director. So I've never met him or done stuff with him. And Jane Badler, I've I've never done any, anything with her either. So I'm very excited. Very cool. Yeah. And and you got to take the infamous picture of me and Lee Majors where Lee tickles me. Yes. <laughs> that dude is hilarious. Yes, he is. <laughs> uh, and this show is hilarious too. I hope I hope uh, you're all enjoying it and checking it out. I'll also put links if you want to get a copy of it via Amazon because they do sell the complete series on DVD. So that's going to do it for this episode of the Back Cave Podcast. Stay tuned, folks. Joe and I will be back again soon to talk more Monster Squad. Kevin Eldridge and I will be back talking more Electro Woman and Dyna Girl. Robert Long will be here for our Some Days You Just Can't Get Rid of a Bomb movie series of movies that were inspired by Batman 66 and... Dan Greenfield and I will be looking at the 66 comics from DC Comics. And Jim Beard and I will be getting back together soon to be talking the Batman 1943 movie serial. It's all happening here on the Batcave podcast. So until next time, thank you so much for listening. Once again, Joe, citizens, take care. Honey Bear says we love you. <laughs> Thanks for listening, chums. I don't have a bat phone, but you can contact the Batcave Podcast through its Facebook page, Twitter, email at thebatcavepodcast at gmail.com. Subscribe to the podcast via Libsyn.com. That's L-I-B-S-Y-N dot com. Or through iTunes. The Batcave Podcast is part of a series of pop culture podcasts from the Chronic Rift Network. Find them at chronicrift.com. So until next time, citizens, same bat time, same bat cave podcast. Mm-hmm.